Back in 2011, you spoke about Islamophobia and you said it passed the dinner table test in Britain. That it was basically become an acceptable form of, of racism. Where are we at now, eight years on? I, I think that Islamophobia is Britain's bigotry blind spot. And even when we see it, we have journalists in mainstream, in the mainstream media talking about being proud of being an Islamophobe. I and mean, people wear it as a badge of honour. I mean, there were articles in, I won't mention the publications saying, oh, there's not enough Islamophobia. I mean, these are the kind of headlines people write. It's, it's not just past the dinner table test now. It's, it's, it is actually our bigotry blind spot. Two weeks ago, a far-right terrorist massacred dozens of, dozens of Muslims uh, in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. Uh, he posted articles from the British press on his Twitter feed. He'd carved Rotherham onto his gun. I mean, is there a danger? Elements of the media, not all the media, etc. Elements of the media are acting as hate preachers. They're helping to radicalise people. Violence is, is born out of the environment within which we effectively green light that kind of behaviour. You know, if, if politicians make Islamophobic comments, if the media run constant Islamophobic headlines, if if the media run newspaper articles which subsequently turn out to be completely untrue, but hey, let's just shrug our shoulders and print an apology deep in the paper somewhere. If columnists write these inflammatory pieces, you know, if we gaslight and green light bigotry, then of course we're going to see it manifest itself in the form of, of, of violence. And I think when people said they were shocked by Christchurch or surprised by it. I was n neither shocked nor surprised. I mean, this has been a long time coming. I've been warning of the climate that we're creating. I mean, it's why I felt, even as somebody who's deeply Eurosceptic, I voted Remain because I felt that we were running campaigns in, in, in politics now where we were creating that atmosphere of, of toxicity which leads to this kind of behaviour. Um, you've been very outspoken about Islamophobia within your own party. Where are we at with with Islamophobia in the Tories at the moment? Uh, only today, Owen, I've met two people. One of them said he has been pursuing now for over six months uh, a complaint about um, an elected councillor uh, who basically uh, called him a Muslim C-word. By the way, this guy's not even Muslim. He's, uh, I don't know what religion he is, uh, but he's not Muslim. And I've had another case where um, a man has been given the nickname uh, by um, a regional member of the party uh, of Oran, and it st stands for orangutan because this guy is Asian and because of the way he apparently they think he looks. But for me, the challenge is not the individual, the challenge is what the institution does about it when they are, are made aware of these comments. And that's why I've said that this is institutional failure, that if you look at these particular complaints, these have been ongoing for months and months and months and that, sadly, my party have only acted on complaints when the media have highlighted them, when, you know, I call it trial by Twitter. You know, that is what has led to suspensions and expulsions. And even after suspensions and expulsions, we've let people back in again. We're sending out the message that this this stuff isn't serious, actually, you can get away with it. That's the, the, Effectively, it's revolving door racism. You can say stuff, you can go out, you can come back in again, and we're all back to where we were. And my argument to my party is, you know, you, you, do we have to get it wrong every time? You know, this is an opportunity for you to get it right, to get ahead of this issue. It's a shame that my party is dealing with this issue by, as I call it, death by a thousand cuts. It could have just been a moment for them to show some serious leadership on it. Well, I mean, one of the data, bits of data you, you highlighted was that half at the moment of Tory voters said they see Islam as a threat to the British way of life. 47% believe the conspiracy through the no-go areas. Why is that happening and what does the party have to do to challenge those actions? And that's the question I'm asking the party. What I'm saying to them is, does it not deeply trouble you that people who vote for us think this this stuff, you know, conspiracy theories and all the other crazy stuff that they're thinking. And if they are and they're attracted to us, what is it that we're doing to make them feel like today's Conservative Party is a home for them? Yeah. And, you know, I call it the the ukipification of the party. I was involved in Project Detox, you know, let's get rid of this nasty party image, mm -hmm. let's genuinely be inclusive, forward looking, open, go out, reach, bring new people in. And there was a moment of excitement, but now we're regressing. Not only is it morally wrong, I mean, it's electro electoral self-harm. Particularly amongst younger people who, whose, issue, whose attitudes are very different on these. And the argument I keep making is I speak to people who, you know, should instinctively be conservative, but who are saying Jeremy Corbyn. 
kids in our family who say, oh my God, isn't Jeremy Corbyn amazing? And I'm thinking, well, how has this been where my party has created an atmosphere where my own, you know, the kids in our own families are starting to feel deeply uncomfortable about being a part of this this party. And I said, you know, you're clearly sending out some message to these communities. And the latest polling shows that 77% of all BAME voters vote Labour. That should horrify us. Well, one of the, I suppose, colleagues you've, you've spoken about particularly about is Michael Gove and his book, Celsius 7-7, uh, the role you thought he had with David Cameron in terms of attitude towards Muslims. He could become leader. There's a very good chance he'd become leader. Would you stay, do you think, in a party if, if he was leader? I think a party who picks him as a leader has got major problems. I'm the least of their problems at that point. You know, and I'm not the only one that's raised concerns about Michael. You know, Ken Clark's spoken about it. The, you know, even his you know, friends close to him. Um, even David Cameron has, 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 has spoken about concerns about he, he, the way he views the world and the way he views certain communities. Yeah, I, I, you know, I just don't even want to imagine it. Uh, you know, Owen, I, I, I've sat in too many meetings and, you know, done everything from high, you know, rolling my eyes to thinking, oh, gosh, you know, thank God he's not Prime Minister. Yet. Um, the definition on Islamophobia. Yes. Do you welcome that? Is that something which is an yeah. important step forward? Yeah, because for, for many, many years now, one of the arguments about Islamophobia has been, well, we don't have an agreed definition. So we came up with this definition, which is that Islamophobia is rooted in racism. It's a form of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. And that, that was really important because we heard evidence from Sikhs who'd been subjected to Islamophobic attacks and we'd heard evidence from non-Muslims who had been perceived to be Muslim and had been, uh, had been discriminated against for that reason. It's had the support of over 80 academics, people who are experts in this area. Organisations across the UK and institutions have signed this and, um, and endorsed it. The Liberal Democrats have, the Labour Party has endorsed it, Plaid have endorsed it, other parties are following. And here I find my party dragging its heels and saying, oh, we can't adopt, even though it was presented to my party and to the Home Secretary before anybody else. I've heard some argument to say, well, we, we will get a definition, but it won't, be, it won't be that definition. We want to make changes to it. And I sit there flabbergasted thinking, have you learnt nothing from the Labour Party's experience with the IHRA? One, it's deeply insulting, but secondly, it's exactly the space that the Labour Party got itself into. And then what it's also saying is, what they're also saying is, oh, but there are some um, fringe British Muslim voices who don't like this definition. And I went, you just don't see the parallels at all here. Donald Trump, I'm afraid to say, is President of the United States. You uh, don't say. <laughs> he is, I'm afraid. Bombshell, everyone. If you've just woken <laughs> up after being asleep Sleep for two and a half years. <laughs> so you've got Trump, uh, you know, having talked about you know, the Muslim ban and spoken about Muslims in these horrendously, overtly racist ways. You've got the far right on the rise across Europe at the moment. Where's your worry about where this can lead? And what would you say to non-Muslims who want to be allies, who want to stand with Muslim people when they're attacked by mainstream media and mainstream politics? What can people do? Both my grandfathers served in the British Indian Army. And 10 years after the war came to an end, my grandfather arrived here in the 50s. And he worked his back, you know, in the mills that my parents did and we didn't break the law. And I went on, you know, to serve my country at the top table. And I now have family back in the armed forces. And the question I ask is, what more can we do? At what point do Muslims have to stop taking the loyalty test? How many times do we have to serve our country either in uniform or at the top table before we're seen as the enemy within? And don't judge a whole community by a few exceptions, because if we were to do that across all communities, we'd all hate each other. Well-meaning people have to first of all be prepared to challenge the, the lies that are put out in the media, challenge stories. I mean, it's a mammoth task, challenge politicians for the language that they use. The community does feel under siege at the moment. There are conversations happening in middle-class Muslim homes right now across the country. People who are socially mobile and people who can move up and out about is there an alternative? And this should deeply trouble us as a nation. I remember growing up, my dad saying, oh, I'm going to build a house in the north of Punjab. And, and my mum would say, oh, forget your great dream. But actually, we need to have a home in Pakistan because when we are told to leave, we'll have somewhere to go to. And I used to look at them both and think, 
really why are you investing in the north of Punjab one the exchange rate is terrible and you're going to lose all your investment and mom where do you think we're going to be told to leave from this is there's only one direction of travel and I say here I am nearly 50 dreaming my dad's dream and worrying my mom's worry and I'm about as establishment as you can get I'm a member of the house of lords and a privy a house of lords and a privy councillor and if that's how I am starting to feel how does little Ali in Bradford feel? You know, how does little Fatima in Leicester feel? How, what message are we sending out to young Muslims who are signing up to join our armed forces and wearing our country's uniform with pride? That you're still, you still don't belong? That you still don't matter? And that eventually, if you go and do something wrong, and irrespective of the fact that somebody next to you, you know, John Smith might go out and do exactly the same wrong thing, you will be told you're a second class citizen and you could be stripped and told to go back home. Even though you've never been back home, even though you've never seen back home, even though it was something where your great grandfather came from once in some distant memory, how far back are we going to go? And societies are strongest when we make them feel like, when we make everybody feel like they belong and they matter. So I would just say to well-meaning people, look at everything that we're doing and do it in a way where we're making British Muslims feel like they belong and they matter. Wow, uh, I think that was an extremely powerful interview. I think it should be a wake-up call that our Muslim siblings, that so many feel scared and worried about their future in this country is something that should horrify all of us. Now, obviously this is about partly the governing party, which has a big impact on all of our lives, but it's not just about the Conservative Party, it's about mainstream media outlets, and it's about the fact that Islamophobia is on the rise, not just in Britain, but all over the world, and we've got to ally together to take it on. We've got lots of interviews coming up. Uh, click on some of the interviews we've done, Make your suggestions about who you should talk to. As ever, subscribe. I'll see you next time.